Honorable members, it's my duty to advise you of the unavoidable absence of the speaker. Consequently, and pursuant to Standing Order 12, the deputy speaker will take the chair. I invite the member for Fraser Nicola to lead this house in prayer or reflection. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. For flowers that bloom about our feet, for tender grass so fresh, so sweet, for song of bird and hum of bee, for all things fair we hear or see, Father in heaven, we thank thee. For blue of stream and blue of sky, for pleasant shade of branches high, for fragrant air and cooling breeze, for beauty of the blooming trees. Father in heaven, we thank thee. Introductions by members. Member for Richmond, Queensborough. In the house today, we have my good friend, Aaron Haskett, 
up in the gallery who has joined us for Creative BC Week. Erin is a president and executive producer of Lark Productions. With over 20 years of experience developing and producing ex exceptional content like Family Law, Motive, uh, she's also the chair of the Canadian Media Producers Association and National Board of Directors. Please welcome her. Member for Richmond, Steveston. Thank you, Speaker. Joining us today in the gallery is my favorite oldest son, William. Uh, he's in grade eight. Uh, he's smart and kind, and we love watching Beat Bobby play together. Please make him feel welcome. Minister for Water, Land and Resource Stewardship. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I have two uh, members of my team joining us today, one leaving, unfortunately, and one joining. Uh, Quinn McTavish has worked with us for a, a number of, of months and is going off to Queen's University to get even smarter than he already is. And he has witnessed uh, question periods live right across this country, but apparently not British Columbia's until today. Uh, which is, of course, a unique site. And Lauren Reed is joining us as well, who has just joined our team from Vancouver. I'm very excited to have her on the team, and I wish Quinn the very best of luck in the future. Would the House uh, join me in making them feel welcome? No? Okay. Wow. Seeing no further introductions. Ah. Oh, is there one? <laughs> nope. Keep All right. Thank you. Honorable Clerk. Introduction of bills. Leader of the Third Party. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. I move that a bill entitled the, entitled the Members' Conflict of Interest Amendment Act, of which notice has been given on my name, on the order paper be introduced and read a first time now. Trust is a critical component of democracy. Without trust, without the public's ability to rely on their elected leaders to represent the public interest, the health of democracy is imperiled. Danielle Allen, the author of Justice by Means of Democracy, explains this so well. The work of democracy, she says, is to endlessly resist capture. For too long, BC had been dubbed the Wild West of corporate influence. Several years ago, we worked hard to update our lobbying legislation to ensure that corporate influence on our assembly and on functions of government was more transparent and was mitigated. We banned corporate and union donations to keep big money out of politics. And since those changes, other loopholes in BC legislation have come to light. But the work to resist capture cannot stop. The Members' Conflict of Interest Amendment Act up updates the act which safeguards against conflicts of interest among members of this assembly. Our provincial act is sorely out of line with jurisdictions across the country. And we have seen the consequences as the relationships between large corporations and this assembly are perceived by the public to have overruled the public interest. To be frank, that perception is not unfounded. This legislation modernizes the Members' Conflict of Interest Act by setting out time limits for former members of this assembly before they can enter into contracts of service, accept board appointments, or accept employment positions with organizations where such an activity could take improper advantage of the member's former office. For former members, the time limit is set at 12 months. For members of the Executive Council, the time is set at 24 months. Finally, one additional change increases the fine for contravention of the Act. Currently, that is $5,000, which is small compared to other jurisdictions. For that reason, this amendment Act adopts a fine used in Alberta's Conflict of Interest Act and raises that fine to $50,000. Thank you, Member. Statements? The oh, the question is first reading, of course, of the bill. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Member. Speaker, I move that the bill be placed on the orders of the day for second reading at the next seating of the House after today. Members have heard the question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Honorable speak Honorable Clerk. Statements by members. Member for West Vancouver, Capilano. Mr. Speaker, um, uh, Earth Day marks the anniversary of the birth of the modern environmental movement. On April 22nd, the world will come together to celebrate our Earth, its bounty, and our obligation to care for it. We need to talk about the toll of climate change and the causes of it. We need to act for our planet and for our children. Today I'd like us to think about the joy our earth and nature brings us and how we can connect more closely with it. I'm going to start with a poem by Jane Yolen. 
I am the earth and the earth is me. Each blade of grass, each honey tree, each bit of mud and stick and stone is blood and muscle, skin and bone. And just as I need every bit of me to make my body fit, so earth needs grass and stone and trees and things that grow here naturally. That's why we celebrate this day. That's why across the world we say, as long as life, as dear, as free, I am the earth and the earth is me. This year's theme is invest in our planet. It's important to have a special day to help us stop and think about our relationship with Earth, but every day should be Earth Day. So although we get together and participate in many wonderful things like local cleanups, we plant trees in our community, we need to also think each day of the products that we buy and the kilometers that we drive. Um, I will end also with the part of a poem. It's actually a 64-page poem, but since my time here is limited, uh, I'm just going to move to the last line of the poem. Uh, so, so at the end of the Lorax, Dr. Seuss writes, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Member. Member for Vancouver, Kensington. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Florchita Bautista, now a seniors advocate in Vancouver, spent her younger years in the Philippines under the Marcos dictatorship as a progressive religious nun, living the preferential option for the poor, particularly for the workers, the urban poor, and the indigenous peoples in the Cordillera. She was a member of the Missionary Sisters of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and worked as a teacher, guidance counselor, and later as a pastoral worker in the various mission sites of the congregation. She left the Philippines as a layperson in the 1980s to come to Canada, where she spent her time organizing live-in caregivers in Toronto, helping raise their awareness about their rights as temporary workers in Canada. In 1989, established AWARE. She's also a filmmaker, and with Marie Boti of Productions Multimond, the two women collaborated to make documentary films describing the real situation of workers in Canadian homes, Brown Women, Blonde Babies in 1991 and When Strangers Reunite in 1999. Flochita moved to Vancouver in 2001 and 2011, Migranti BC held its first assembly and nominated and acclaimed Thank seven you. members to the Migranti BC Coordinating Collective. Anna Cagas Tabella, Florchita Bautista, Leo Alejandria, Vivian Oropel, Juliet Rivetta, Marjorie Etta, and Jane Ordinario. She's also a founding member of the Canada Philippine Solidarity for Human Rights, which was founded in 2008. As well, a writer, she wrote her autobiography, Leaping into the Unknown, in 2006, where she recounted a life full of adventures. And 13 years later, she published Interviews Across Time and Space, where she relieved, relived some of, the exper of these experiences in fictionalized conversations with biblical figures. In her mid-80s, she has dedicated her life to social justice. Flochita continues to inspire as a community organizer, facilitator, teacher, researcher, author, filmmaker, seniors advocate, as well as a generous friend and auntie to all who know and love her. She's much loved. Thank you, member. <laughs> member for Fraser Nicola. Thank you, honorable speaker. When community members come together under a common goal and purpose, they can achieve great things. That spirit is typical of the people of Fraser Nicola, and in this case, the city of Merritt. Years ago, it became apparent that local health care facilities needed an expansion and upgrade to meet increased demand and to address aging infrastructure and equipment. Recognizing that the ER at the Nicola Valley Hospital and Health Centre was designed to support the community's needs half a century ago, a process got underway to build a bigger and more modern emergency department. Noting Merritt's location at the intersection of four busy highways and the need for high quality health care services, not only for current residents but to attract future residents as well, the people of Merritt were fully behind this plan generously contributing their time, energy, and funds to make it happen through the Nicola Valley Healthcare Endowment Foundation and the Nicola Valley Healthcare Auxiliary. 
and boy did they come through in a big way, better than anyone expected. They raised a whopping $700,000 to help make this much needed facility a reality, to improve local health care services and to benefit their community at large. It was an impressive feat, one that still astounds me today. We often talk about how rural people are strong and resilient, and that is true. But after all that work, just imagine how frustrated they are to find themselves on protest lines after 10 ER closures in less than four months. Thank you. Thank you, member. Member for Langley East. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. It's a privilege today to rise in the House in recognition of Creative uh, Industries Week in British Columbia. This week celebrates the contributions of our province's creative industries, which include the motion picture industry, music, interactive and digital media, and of course, book and magazine publishing. We are fortunate to have a wealth of creative talent and infrastructure to support a thriving creative sector here in British Columbia, which makes us a global leader in a sector that drives our economy and creates prosperity for everyone. We are one of the largest motion picture hubs in Canada and North America. We are the second largest English language book publishing market and the third largest centre for music in the country. We are also home to one of the world's largest animation and visual effects cluster and the second largest video games workforce in Canada. All of this with the support of Creative BC, which is BC's independent, not-for-profit agency that has been developing our creative sector for 10 years. And that's why we're so pleased to support the continued growth of British Columbia's creative industries with the announcement yesterday of a historic investment of $42 million. Every year, the industry associations come together to celebrate the people who work in BC's creative sector, offer a range of entertaining activities, and raise awareness about the valuable work that they do. Over the past week, the building was filled with energy, and I've had a fantastic time attending events and learning more about local artists and businesses. Special thanks to our key partners, Canadian Media Producers Association, BC Branch, Motion Picture Production Industry Association, Association of B Book Publishers of BC, DigiBC, the VFX and Animation Alliance of BC, Music BC, and the Magazine Association of BC. I ask the House to join me today in celebrating Creative Industries Week. To my colleagues, I encourage you to check out bccreates.com, which includes an interactive map that allows you to identify local creators in your region. Thank and you I member. encourage everyone to buy, promote, and share the work of BC's creators. Thank you. Thank you, Member. <laughs> member for Saanich North and the Islands. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. When the COVID-19 pandemic began three years ago, it drew the inequalities of our world into the daylight. Disproportionately, it was racialized workers who became ill and died because they were more likely to work in low-paid jobs deemed essential when everyone else was told to stay home. Gender inequalities in the household work and layoffs emerged. It was called a she-session. The gap between the rich and the poor grew. Where gender and race and disability intersected, the impacts were all the more complex and challenging. A lot has changed since the outset of the pandemic. In British Columbia, many of our job losses have been regained, but we all know that jobs are not all created equal. And we know that our province remains a deeply inequitable place. While a few individuals and corporations swim in windfall profits, many are growing increasingly desperate because of the cost of living, the housing crisis, the toxic drug crisis, the impact of extreme weather events. We celebrate the hard-won battles of workers throughout history. Workers are why we have a weekend, why we have a minimum wage, why we have the right to refuse unsafe work. Workers, people, organized and fought for these, hard, for these wins. These wins do not absolve us from the responsibility we have to address inequality and inequity. We must challenge the notion that a small step towards pay equity is good enough. We should not sit idly by and accepting the burden be unfairly carried for yet another generation. Today our fights are for pay equity. Housing is a human right and clean air in the workplace, demanding the government decide with people 
instead of corporations. And even as the banners in this House change, it seemed the fights remain the same. Member for Coquitlam, Burke Mountain. I'm a big fan of our BCHL team, the Coquitlam Express, not just for their on-ice skills, but for the way they contribute back to our community. Under the inspired leadership of General Manager Telly Campbell, the Express has put together an impressive lineup of community service. From their anti-bullying campaign, See Something, Do Something, encouraging people to take positive action when they encounter bullying, to, to hosting their first ever Pride Night to drive social change and foster inclusivity. Tally said everyone has the right to feel accepted and we have a duty to our players, our fans and ourselves to be the voice of, ex of acceptance. Last season, Express Captain Ryan Tattle raised nearly $95,000 for cancer research as part of his finer, final Junior A hockey season. His teammates raised over $20,000 by auctioning special game-worn jerseys. Also last season, the Co Coquitlam Express honoured our Indigenous roots with a special jersey worn by players in a game promoted as Coquitlam First Nation Night. Their good work continued this season with each player choosing a charity of choice to support by volunteering, donating and promoting that charity. In February, the team partnered with Juvenile D Diabetes Research Foundation and Diabetes Canada to host a diabetes awareness game. Players wore specially designed jerseys that were auctioned off after the game to raise money for diabetes. In March, they hosted their second annual Hockey Talks Mental Health Awareness Game, where groups distributed information to fans about mental health uh, resources available in our community. This was followed by their Autism Acceptance Game, where a more sensory-friendly game experience was created. The music volume was lowered, the horn was not used, and a designed quiet room was provided for those needing a break from the sensory-rich hockey game environment. The Coquitlam Express are true community champions for making their players better citizens and, our, and for making our community a better, more inclusive place to live. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Member. <laughs> Minister for Post-Secondary Education and Future Skills. Speaker, I seek leave to make an introduction. Is leave granted? Aye. Please proceed. Well, 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 Mr. Speaker, as you may well know, we have a special birthday in the House. Um, the Minister of Health is now as old as I am, and I want to welcome him into his 60th year. Can the House please wish him here? So, I, I want to clarify, Mr. Speaker, he's not 60 yet. He is just starting his 60th year. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. <laughs> Shots fired. Honourable Clerk. Oral questions by members? Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, anti-Semitism is on the rise in Canada, more than doubling in the past decade. Despite representing just over 1% of the Canadian population, the Jewish community is the target of a staggering 56% of all reported hate crimes in the country. In British Columbia last year alone, there were 51 cases of vandalism, 53 incidents of harassment, violent attacks, and 137 cases of online hate. Now to combat this serious problem, we need a crystal clear and comprehensive understanding of what constitutes anti-Semitism. Now the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance has brought forward a definition of anti-Semitism based on the lived experiences of Jews around the world and provides a strong framework for identifying and fighting this insidious form of hate. So my question to the Premier is simple. Will he stand up and adopt the IRA definition of anti-Semitism here in British Columbia? Minister of Post-Secondary Education. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the Leader of the Opposition 
asking, uh, asking the question. <clears throat> and as a, a Jewish member of this caucus and as a Jewish member of this house, um, I um, am grateful for the opportunity to talk about the challenges of, of hatred and racism and anti-Semitism. In fact, um, this has been work that uh, we started as a government in 2017, identifying uh, ways to address and combat anti-Semitism um, and racism and mitigate its impacts. And I'm very proud to say that uh, working together with, uh, the, with CJA, uh, the Canadian Israel Jewish Affairs um, organization, that uh, under the leadership of the previous Premier John Horgan, uh, this government has adopted and is working with the IRA definition of, uh, of anti-Semitism as, uh, as a government. We've adopted it uh, because the federal government has, has adopted as well in demonstrating leadership, and we're joining um, all these other um, jurisdictions in making sure that that's the functional definition of anti-Semitism here in British Columbia. Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The only problem with that answer is that they haven't adopted it into law. Uh, it's important that when we take a stand against hate, violence, and anti-Semitism, uh, we have to do so with courage. And it takes more than mere words. It calls for concrete legislative action. Ontario, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, and as the member noted, the federal government, indeed, have all taken concrete steps to protect Jewish communities by formally adopting the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. For years, Jewish groups have been asking this BC government to follow suit and formally adopt the definition, including B'nai B'rith, in a letter to the Premier just earlier this week. The IHRA definition is world-leading as a clear and comprehensive example of what anti-Semitism means. Refusing to formally adopt the IRA definition through legislation sends an unmistakable message in the face of a growing rise of hate, bigotry, and prejudice against the Jewish community. So again, to the Premier, will the Premier listen to the voices of Holocaust survivors and their descendants follow the, he the lead of the federal government and take immediate legislative action to formally adopt the IRA definition of anti-Semitism right here in British Columbia. Here, here. Minister of Post-Secondary Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And as I've said, stated in this House, that this government has adopted the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. We recognize they really have a hard time listening to answers, Mr. Speaker. I don't quite understand what their challenge is. We've been working together with the organized Jewish community, making sure that we understand and that we hear their voices about how to best proceed around this. I know that CJA is, um, is very um, uh, supportive of the work that we have been doing, not just around adopting IRA as our, um, as our definition for how to, how to work uh, and address anti-Semitism, but our work to invest in Holocaust education because we know how important that is, uh, uh, we know that uh, we, we've been investing in, in the uh, public schools. We've been investing in um, um, and supporting the JCC. I think that's also critically important. We've delivered $25 million as a government to make sure that the Jewish Community Center uh, can redevelop and help uh, continue to educate British Columbians about the impacts of the Holocaust and to address the root causes of anti-Semitism, Mr. Speaker, because we know that how important that is. Member for Vancouver, Langara. Mr. Speaker, I certainly recognize uh, what is occurring uh, within the Jewish community, including in my riding of Vancouver, Langara, and the JCC, the Jewish Community Center, uh, as the uh, minister just responded to. But the problem with that response is that it admits some pretty significant facts about where this government has been including the Premier's personal active opposition to adopting the IRA definition of anti-Semitism here in BC. For years, I have urged this government to formally adopt that definition in BC, which led to the creation of an internal government briefing note dated May 26, 2022. That briefing note accessed under FOI, 
makes it very clear that the multiculturalism and anti-racism branches of government received specific direction from the then Attorney General not to adopt the IRA definition. He personally intervened to direct that the definition not be formally adopted through legislation in BC. The question is simple. Why did the Premier personally block the adoption of the IRA definition of anti-Semitism in BC through legislation? Minister of Post-Secondary Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, first of all, I have to say we'd already adopted it. We had already adopted it. I, again, they really do have a hard time listening to an answer. Please proceed now. Thank Mr. you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, again, we had already formally taken a look at the definition. We've engaged with CJA. We've uh, created a policy about how we are working forward with this. And, and again, the leader of the opposition continues to interrupt me, Mr. Speaker. I don't understand what's so hard about listening to an answer. Members, we'll have some order, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So again, um, and so we had already taken it, that in as part of our work around anti-racism. Um, and we've been working closely with the organized Jewish community that let us know that that was absolutely acceptable to them in terms of addressing the root causes of anti-Semitism. It works for the organized Jewish community, Mr. Speaker. That's what they w said would work for them, and we've worked with them to create this opportunity. Now, however, Mr. Speaker. Community is how you get things done, Mr. Speaker, and that's what we were doing is working with community. However, Mr. Speaker, I do want to point out that the people on the other side were the people who got rid of the Human Rights Commissioner, Mr. Speaker. That shows you how much they care about people's human rights. We brought it back, Mr. Speaker, because we work with community to make sure that everyone is safe, regardless of their religion, their faith, their gender, their color. Member Vancouver Langara. Mr. Speaker, in the six years that this government has been dragging its feet on adopting the IRA definition of anti Semitism in British Columbia, there have been nearly 1,600 anti Semitic incidents here in our province. 1,600. Ontario, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, all of the Western provinces except for BC have adopted this definition. In legislation, across government, that is what we've been asking for. In the same period that the letter from the former Premier was provided, which did not in any way formally adopt the IRA definition of anti Semitism in BC, the Premier, in his role as the Attorney General, gave that specific direction not to adopt the definition. The briefing note dated May 22, 2022, tells a very different story as to the reasons for why that was not adopted. On page two, it highlights the quote, difficulties of adopting the definition in the current political climate, end quote. 28 countries, Mr. Speaker, including Canada, and every Western province except BC have adopted the definition. The only difficult political climate is within the NDP, which not only refused to adopt the definition, but also had over 40 riding associations oppose the IRA definition of anti-Semitism during a convention 18 months ago. This opposition includes the federal ridings for the members from North Vancouver Seymour and Burnaby North, as well as the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions and the Attorney General. The Premier must prioritize combating hate, bigotry, and prejudice against the Jewish community over internal NDP politics. Will the Premier set internal NDP politics aside and do the right thing by formally adopting the IRA definition of anti-Semitism here in BC through legislation? Minister of Post-Secondary Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I have to say um, how hard it is as a Jewish person to sit in this place 
who has been working diligently with the Jewish community, with the community, to identify how to best address anti-Semitism. And to hear the member opposite suggest that, that this government isn't doing that work, is it a per I take that uh, as a personal affront, I have to say, Mr. Speaker, um, because we have been working diligently with the community. The community wants their government to work with them. It is exactly how we have been proceeding. The member refers to federal writings. Some of my colleagues are connected to federal writings. Others are not. However, I think it's really important, and this I think I want all members to listen very carefully. You need to work with the community. It is what we have been doing, and it's what we will continue to do. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I've been reflecting on the Minister of Environment's answers to my questions yesterday. He seemed to think that I was asking if the former Premier had lobbied him since leaving office, but that's not what I was asking. My question was whether the former Premier had discussed the issue of referring tax pollution of the Elk Valley to the International Joint Commission while he was still Premier. What I think the public has a right to know is just how involved the former Premier was in advocating on behalf of TAC before he resigned as Premier and began negotiating with TAC about a board appointment to their spin-off company, Elk Valley Resources. I've read the entire FOI package. For over 12 months, two members of the Premier's office were point on the discussion around the referral of tax pollution to the IJC. In the end, two ministers sent a letter to the federal minister arguing she not refer the selenium pollution issue to the IJC. One can logically assume that the former premier, whose staff were point, knew this letter was being sent by his two ministers. My question is to the minister of forests, the former minister of mines. Did he have conversations with the former premier about whether or not to lobby the federal government to not refer the Elk Valley pollution issue to the IJC before the letter to the Minister of Foreign Affairs was sent in April 2022. Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. And there are very few issues, if any, with respect to uh, to the environment, with respect to international obligations relating to the environment, with respect to uh, impacts of mining or work in which my ministry is engaged, about which I have not had numerous discussions and meetings. However, to the best of my recollection, I never had a discussion about the IJC with the former Premier. Leader, third party supplemental. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker, and I, I thank the Minister for a, a clear answer to that. Um, uh, it's, it's fascinating um, because the FOI package paints a pretty clear picture. The issue is that the former senior decision maker of this province, whose staff members from his office were heavily involved, regularly involved in the discussions around trying to prevent a company's pollution issue being referred to the International Joint Commission. Less than a year later, that former decision maker announced that he is taking a position on that company's board. This isn't about metallurgical coal for steel or bicycles or windmills. This is about power, influence, and access. And ultimately, it's about public trust in government and how decisions are made in this province, something that the members on that side of the House used to be very passionate about. 47 lobbying meetings, dozens and dozens of me emails from the Premier's office about the referral to the IJC, public expressions of frustration by First Nations on both sides of the border, a letter from two ministers Question to the federal member. government making the case against the IJC referral, and a former Premier announcing his board appointment less than 24 hours after his resignation as MLA. My question, Honourable Speaker, is through you to the Premier. What does the Premier say to the people of British Columbia in light of this timeline and these outcomes? 
Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. I, uh, I gave the member a clear answer yesterday. I gave the member a clear answer today. Uh, I mean, anybody can take a sequence of events and try to connect them. But I can assure the member, and I can assure every member of this legislature, that when positions are taken by ministers of this government or by the government as a whole, it's taken after a fulsome analysis of the issues that are under consideration. Now, the member would have the people of British Columbia believe that absent an international joint commission, no work whatsoever is being done on water quality as a result of metallurgical coal mining in the southeast of this province, and that is simply not true. What has been going on on a regular basis for years is consultation with the Tanaha, consultation with the United States state governments, consultation and discussion uh, with academics on both sides of the border about appropriate uh, concentrations to set uh, water quality levels. That's the work we do. That's the work we're continuing to do. That's the work to which we are absolutely committed, and we're committed to fast track that work, the acceptability, the agreement of the nations, the acceptance of a proper and appropriate water quality uh, level in the Elk Valley so that the economy can continue to work and the fish and the people who depend on the water can continue to be safe. And an international joint commission Thank doesn't you, accomplish that. It's the work with scientists, Thank you, nations, and people on either side of the border that accomplishes that. Member for Nechaco Lakes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. For months, this legislature has been hearing about the official opposition asking questions about violent offenders, and government, of course, has been responding with programs as well as political rhetoric. But it's time to quit playing politics. It's time to quit allowing Trudeau's Liberals to handcuff this political system. Members, I need to hear the question. If it is time to quit playing politics and quit allowing Trudeau's federal Liberals to handcuff this government's justice system. We need to remove prolific offenders and violent offenders from our streets so that we can feel safe. I am prepared to use the notwithstanding clause to put criminals away and take back our streets. And let me be crystal clear. If you choose to repeatedly commit crimes or commit violent offenses, I am not concerned about violating your rights. I am concerned about getting justice for your victims. The Premier has spent much of his law career standing up for criminals. It's about time for this province to stand up for victims. Um, to the Premier, will you stand up for British Columbians and finally show that there are consequences for violent offenders? Minister for Public Safety. Thank you, uh, Honourable uh, Speaker, and I uh, appreciate the question uh, from the member. Um, I think one of the cornerstones of our system of government is that we have the legislative which makes the laws and we have an independent judicial system. Uh, and I think that is the best place uh, for our criminal justice system to do its work. Uh, I don't believe that uh, government should be using the notwithstanding clause. I think what governments need to do is to work with the uh, police agencies uh, the men and women who are doing the law enforcement in this province have a very difficult job. Um, it's our job to work with those who are responsible for the Criminal Code of Canada to get the changes that are needed. Uh, it's our responsibility to work with local communities in terms of the challenges that they're facing. That's the approach that, uh, that needs to be taken. That's the approach that we are taking and will continue to take. Member for Nechaco Lakes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate uh, the Minister's answer. Uh, but the Minister has talked a lot about hiring more RCMP officers, and he's also talked about creating the hubs, and these are all good ideas. But with, with the understaffed RCMP, plus other issues, it's hard to expect results. Let's face reality. BC is short more than 400 RCMP officers, and the soft number is closer to 1,500. But with 400 
plus retiring annually, the RSVP recruitment is just not keeping up. Filling positions and burning out officers will be a growing problem. And I know the RCMP are doing the best they can for us in this province. But the police in BC need help. They need help from this government. And the people want to take back our streets. And instead of pointing fingers and placing blame, when will this government put the needs of victims first and get these prolific offenders off our streets? Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. And I, again, I appreciate the question. And there's a, a lot of questions in there to, uh, to try uh, and, and deal with, uh, Honourable Speaker. Um, but I will, I will address uh, one of the questions, part of, of uh, his question, in terms of the, the recruitment um, and the vacancy patterns that we see. Um, it is a complicated and complex issue involving uh, both the federal policing line, the provincial policing line, and the municipal policing line, because each have a different role to play. Um, I can tell you that when it comes to the provincial policing line, that, uh, that the, the number of vacancies, hard vacancies, not soft vacancies, is about 277. Uh, that's why we put in place the funding that we did to fill those vacancies. And I can tell you it's not a question of the province Good having chance. to go and ask for those vacancies to be filled. Um, the, uh, those are done by the, uh, with the federal government, and I can tell you that my ministry has already been working with the, uh, the RCMP uh, in terms of prioritizing areas for the provincial uh, business line. I have spoken with uh, Minister Mendicino uh, shortly after the announcement in terms of the importance uh, British Columbia places on, on filling that, that particular, uh, the provincial line, the largest investment uh, in police resources in the history of this province, and in fact, one of the largest uh, in the history of, uh, this, uh, of this country. At the same time, working with uh, local governments, and I can tell uh, that the, uh, the member of the community that he represents, uh, in the case of Vanderhoof, that the municipal policing line, again, we recognize uh, that we need to ensure that we've got the recruits coming through. We get about 30% uh, of the troop out of, out of depot, and that uh, we, they go through about 900 officers a year, uh, come through there. About 70% don't make it. British Columbia gets a, 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 a third of that. Uh, last year, we received 258 um, officers. Thank you, uh, Minister. I can tell you that we work with the federal government and the RCMP uh, to deal with the very challenging issue of vacancies that the member has raised. Member for Surrey, White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The abrupt closure of SFU's football program has come as a surprise to family, communities, most importantly, the players. Everyone that has been involved with this proud program for the last half century is well aware of its significance. Louis Pisaglia, Glenn Jackson, Sean Millington, Terry Bailey, John McDonald, all players that have gone on to lead in the CFL, be great community leaders. The SFL, SFU football community is united in finding a solution. They have support from alumni, from local leaders, but we have heard nothing from this government in terms of standing up for this program and standing up for these players who are fighting, fighting to keep their season alive. My question is to the Premier. Will he make the call? Will he stand up and will he address this with the president of SFU and get this football program reinstated today? Minister of Post-Secondary Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member for the question. Um, I have been um, hearing from uh, certainly some of the, the football players and the coaches uh, that coach in my community um, who, have, who, are, who have expressed concern about a decision that the uh, SFU has made. Um, and I've also spoken with the president of, of uh, S SFU um, to understand how they are supporting these student athletes there is tremendous disappointment. Um, this has been a, a, a fledgling uh, team for a number of years. Um, the post-secondary institutions, and I know the member opposite um, appreciates this, that they, they do operate independently of government. They have the, um, the operational responsibility of making programmatic decisions based on the best interests of the students and the student athletes. Um, I do understand, Mr. Speaker, as well, that this is before the courts, that there is a, a court action being taken, so it would be inappropriate for me at this point to, um, to say anything further uh, on the matter. Member for Prince George Vailmount. 
Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. Well, the Premier gave specific direction in his mandate letters to ministers, all of them, to champion good ideas regardless of where they came from. But so far, those are just empty words. Sudden cardiac arrest can happen to anyone, anywhere, at any time. And when it does, every single minute counts. Armed with, a CPR, with CPR and automated external defibrillators, we can double the odds of survival. That is why I have repeatedly introduced the Defibrillator Public Access Act requiring visible visibility, registered, and maintained AEDs in public buildings. Ken Karuska, a survivor, says this in support of the bill. I am alive today because of an AED in a hockey arena. Simply put, AEDs save lives. We must do all we can to ensure that people like me can go home to their families, end quote. British Columbians have no idea why a bill that has the potential to save lives, has broad support, has been introduced multiple times in this legislature, is stubbornly refused by this Premier to be called. So could the Premier stand up today and explain to British Columbians how he continues to block a debate about a bill that could save lives? Minister of Health. Well, thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. And like the uh, Honourable Member, I'm, a, I'm strongly committed to a network of AEDs across BC. It's why we work so closely, for example, with the Heart and Stroke Foundation on those issues, why we support that network with them and the growth of that network with them, and why we'll continue to do that. This actually, Honourable Speaker, continues the work that had been done under the previous government in the same regard. And we continue to build out that network and we're gonna to continue to do so. Um, I look forward, because I think there will be an occasion for us shortly in estimates to have a longer discussion with the member on the question. But I think, uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that everybody in BC understands and supports um, the growth and the effectiveness of our AED system. The, the, uh, you know, the education required for people, because it, it also will require educational support to do that. And I look forward to continuing, as I have for a number of years, uh, and the Honourable Member knows um, her intervention, and I understand the sort of community basis and where she came to her intervention and her bill. And I intend to continue to work with her and people across the community, including the Heart and Stroke Foundation, to improve the network in BC. And that's a work that we're going to continue, and I believe uh, that we'll continue to do together. Member for Peace River North. Thanks, uh, Honourable Speaker. More than seven years after the declaration of a public health emergency, the province continues to set one grim record after another. 2,314 deaths in 2022, a record high. 197 deaths just in March, a record for any March. Record 30-day average of overdose calls in March. Highest overdose calls ever on a single day in March, on March 22nd. Unprecedented 19-day streak of 100-plus overdoses. Honourable Speaker, behind every single one of those numbers is a loved one. Behind every single one of those numbers is a family that grieves. I'm one of those families. Honourable Speaker, as someone who sat on the Health Committee, the Select Standing Committee on Health, which was chaired by the now Attorney General, made up of members from both sides of the House. We heard firsthand incredibly heartbreaking stories of those who have lost ones to addiction. Our committee identified gaping holes and a lack of urgency from this NDP government. And I'll list off the top three. Rapidly scale up flexible evidence-based low barrier comprehensive continuum of care. Leverage and strengthen existing mechanisms Question member. to hold the health authorities accountable and identify the touch points. Honourable Speaker, six months later, here we are doing the same thing over and over again and somehow expecting different results. So my question, Honourable Speaker, 
to the Premier, who has chosen to ignore Is there a the committee's member? recommendations and double down on more of the same. Question member. Honourable Speaker. Why is this Premier continuing to double down on doing the same thing and expecting different results? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member for, uh, for, raising, for raising the question and uh, want to uh, take the opportunity to reflect on the most recent coroner's report and, of course, agree that each of these deaths is tragic. They represent our neighbours, our friends, members of our community, and I know we all extend condolences to those who have lost loved ones in this unrelenting toxic drug crisis. Mr. Speaker, we have taken uh, numerous steps to, uh, to match the recommendations from the Select Standing Committee. Of course, much of that work, and we are very grateful for the collaboration across this House in that work. Those recommendations in many respects confirmed uh, work that we are doing across our healthcare system with our community partners, scaling up harm reduction, uh, making, uh, making harm reduction services more broadly available, working to scale up treatment um, uh, opportunities, opening hundreds of beds, investing in upstream mental health services for children and youth, working across that entire continuum with an unprecedented billion dollar investment in this budget. We will continue to do that work with our health authorities, with our community partners, and uh, I know that uh, working, working together, we know, is the way to get that, that we will be able to address these challenges. Bell ends question period. Recognizing the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I seek leave to make an introduction. Is leave granted? Aye. Please proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Speaker. Uh, we're honoured today to have joining us on the floor of uh, this chamber, the Chief Councillor of the Kitsilis First Nation, Glenn Bennett, uh, Wilford McKenzie, a Senior Advisor for the Kitsilis Treaty Process, and Chris Apps, uh, the Director of Lands and Resources for the Kitsilis First Nation. They are here today to sign an agreement with me that's been enabled under our Revitalized Environmental Assessment Act of 2018. It will provide for joint decision-making between the nation and uh, and the uh, Environmental Assessment Office and our government with, that will respect uh, the governance and decision-making structures and ensure that our respective decision-making structures can work together effectively in a clear and predictable manner using the Indigenous uh, knowledge, the values, the culture and the history of the First Nation. Also joining us in the gallery are some of the public servants who worked so hard on bringing us to this uh, uh, tremendous point. Eleanor Arend, Associate Deputy Minister and Chief Executive Assessment Officer at the EAO. Danielle Smith, Executive Director of Indigenous Partnerships and Engagement. Sheldon Foote, Director of Indigenous Partnerships and Engagement, who negotiated the agreement for the Environmental Assessment Office and from the Ministry of Attorney General Tanner Durgis, Legal Counsel. Will the House please join me in making our guests very, very well. Thank you, Minister. Honourable Clerk. Orders of the day. Acting Government House Leader. Thank you, Speaker. In this chamber, I call second reading debate Bill 18, Haida Gwaii Reconciliation Act, in Committee Room A. Continued debate on the Committee of Supply for Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, uh, and to be followed by Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction, if that finishes. In Committee Room C, I called continued debate on Committee of Supply for Ministry of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, members. Just a moment, Minister. We'll wait till the people get to where they need to go so uh, you can be heard in a respectful manner. Thank you, Minister.
Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that Bill 18 be now read a second time. Mr. Speaker, I am honoured to rise today to su support this important step in our commitment to recognize Haida governance as determined and recognized by the Haida Nation. This legislation before us was jointly crafted every step of the way. It's a result of a progressive approach to reconciliation that shows the strong relationship that exists between the Council of the Haida Nation and the province of British Columbia. It was 20 years ago that the leadership of the Haida Nation gave rise to a sea change in our laws and relationship with First Nations. The Council of the Haida Nation and Guja of the Council of the Haida Nation on his behalf and on behalf of all members of the nation initiated a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. It resulted in a unanimous judgment that established the principles applicable to the Crown government's duty to consult. Following that significant decision, in 2010, the Council of the Haida Nation and British Columbia entered into shared decision-making with the Haida Nation through the Haida Gwaii Reconciliation Act. It was a step toward a new relationship between the Haida Nation and our province. Brought forward in this House by the Honourable George Abbott, the legislation strived to apply what the Haida Nation had secured in the courts and established joint and shared decision-making processes for land and natural resource management on Haida Gwaii. Under that legislation, the name Haida Gwaii was also restored. And Madam Speaker, in June 2010, at a joyous celebration in Masset, the people of the Haida Nation officially returned the name, Queen Charlotte Islands, to British Columbia in a traditional Bentwood box. Local school children received specially made globes with their birthplace identified only as Haida Gwaii, symbolizing the restoration of their history for future generations. Our work continues. In August 2021, we entered into the Gay Gulfta Changing Tide Framework for Reconciliation in order to advance our collective work on reconciliation. That agreement was the starting point and the guide for negotiating a number of agreements that will lead step by step to legal recognition, recognition of Haida governance and Haida title on Haida Gwaii. Now, the legislation before the House today is a significant step needed to fulfill that agreement. The legislation recognizes, within provincial laws, that the Haida Nation has inherent rights of governance and self-determination. Also, that the Haida Nation will act through the Council of the Haida Nation as its government. As the government of the Haida Nation, the Council of the Haida Nation will have the powers of a natural person as provided for in this legislation. In addition, the legislation provides immunities to the Haida Nation public officials in the performance of their duties. The legislation enables the transfer of agreements, assets, liabilities, and other obligations currently held by the society called the Secretariat of the Haida Nation, which was incorporated under the BC Societies Act, to the Council of the Haida Nation, and eventually that society would be dissolved. The Secretariat will continue to operate under the Council of the Haida Nation, consistent with the Constitution of the Haida Nation. If approved, the legislation will be the first time that the province would provide formal legal recognition of an Indigenous governing body outside implementing a modern-day treaty. The Haida Nation has for 40 years experience operating a national-level government through the Council of the Haida Nation. The Council of the Haida Nation, formed in 1974 and confirmed by its members as the Haida Nation's governing body in the 2003 Constitution, 
has become its uh, governing uh, institution. BC and Canada have a long-standing relationship with the Haida, developing progressive approaches to reconciliation and joint management of land and resources. Canada is expected to introduce federal companion recognition legislation within the coming year. For British Columbia, this legislation is about changing our own colonial legal structures to recognize the Council of the Haida Nation as the governing body of the Haida Nation and Haida people, just as their own people have recognized them for decades. It's overdue that the province in Canada legally recognize the Haida Nation and the Council of the Haida Nation as its government. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing from other members on this significant next step in our relationship with the Haida Nation. Rec <clears throat> Recognizing the member from Vancouver, Langara. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I uh, wish to uh, speak uh, to this uh, very important bill as it comes forward to the uh, floor of the Legislative Assembly, uh, Bill 18, Haida Nation Recognition Act. Uh, as the minister just outlined uh, in a good way, uh, there's history as to how uh, this legislation is being presented uh, at this time. It's very important to recognize uh, the fundamental case uh, around title in 2002 involving the Haida as uh, presided over by the Supreme Court of Canada decision, which has informed much of the jurisprudence that we look at uh, in the relationship with First Nations. And it's a demonstration, of course, of the uh, challenges to define that relationship purely through the courts. Nations uh, should not have to do that, but they have in various junctures uh, in the history of our province and our country. Haida decision in 2002 certainly is that fundamental decision which has changed much of the approach of government and other proponents, third parties in dealing with various elements around consent of a nation. As the minister just uh, cited, under a former government back in 2010, a BC Liberal government, the Honorable George Abbott introduced important legislation into this house, the Haida Gwaii Reconciliation Act in June of 2010. That Reconciliation Act set out for a new relationship with the Haida Nation and certainly recognized then that the Haida Nation was represented by the Council of the Haida Nation, which of course, Madam Speaker, is the subject of this Recognition Act, Bill 18. As the minister mentioned in his second reading speech here, that important act brought in by the Honorable George Abbott, as a member for Shushwap, had important elements of reconciliation set out, including around shared decision making around forestry, for example, forest and rain practices, and set out requirements that the council would determine the allowable annual cut, for example, at least once in every 10 years after the last date of determination is set out in the act. As importantly, it does provide for protected areas management. And we know, of course, the Haida Gwaii is a very significant part of our province in terms of the need to protect very important marine and terrestrial lands. 
of the Haida. That management plan included a plan to set out protection and use for management of natural resources, including wildlife and wildlife habitat, cultural or recreational values, and of a protected area that's developed under the direction of the council. So, Madam Speaker, these are examples for that framework legislation that was in place in 2010 that had set out that new relationship and provided for the type of shared decision making between the province and the Haida Nation. We've seen in the last decades in this house, various agreements and relationship agreements and governance agreements to recognize the importance of partnership with First Nations and their inherent right of self-governance. This particular bill Bridging off the Changing Tides Agreement, as the Minister referred to, continues that work. And I know that when I had the opportunity to have discussion, both with the Minister's predecessor for Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, as well as this Minister as well, in, in his current capacity, we've had good discussion around the recognition of indigenous governing bodies in this province. I appreciate that that term is not being utilized in this act. But as we look at governance and the relationship with First Nations in our province, this is, as the minister said, a significant next step as the first time where the government of BC is recognizing a First Nation as what has been referred to in a proper government. Outside of the Indian Act and the Societies Act as we've seen in this context as well. So, Madam Speaker, it will be important to consider with government as we get the kind of clarity around governance with the Haida. And I know, of course, we recognize that it is for the nation themselves and the indigenous community to determine what their governance is. There is certainly recognition that the Haida Nation is recognized in the context of its own indigenous legal orders. We know, of course, Madam Speaker, and we recognize that the Haida Nation had passed its own constitution, which in, 20, in 2003, which confirmed that the Council of the Haida Nation is that nation's nation-level government. And Madam Speaker, when you consider the Constitution itself, which is publicly available on the Council of Haida Nation's website, the article set out the governance framework around the Council of Haida Nation. It refers to the village and band councils, including, of course, Old Massett Village Council and Skittigate Band Council, and how each of those councils will elect a councillor to the councillor council of the Haida Nation. That, in respect to the Hereditary Chiefs Council, that the pot lodged hereditary chiefs will assemble as the hereditary chiefs council to address issues of the Haida Nation. And that the hereditary chiefs will be notified of sittings of the council of the Haida Nation 
and will be, re and will be requested to attend. These are just examples, Madam Speaker, of the composition, let's say, and the relationships of the Council of Haida Nations. Certainly, to both Indian Act recognized governance structures as well as hereditary recognized governance structures within the Haida Nation. The mandates are set out quite clearly in terms of the roles of the Council of the Haida Nation. The President, the Vice President, the Executive Committee, regional representatives, and the sittings. As well as the Secretariat. These are the formalized structures that are in place under the Council of the Haida Nation. And again, Madam Speaker, I think it's important that we recognize the length of establishment to get to this point, the workings of the existing governance structure that is in place with the Haida Nation. And also to understand as we look at how, for example, the Council of the Haida Nation under its own constitution sets out the ways in which international agreements will be dealt with, the ways that there would be discipline and removal of elected representatives, the ways in which a ju judicial tribunal may be convened to resolve internal conflicts. I think this is a very important time, and it's a very important time to understand as we have this discussion and as we recognize the further agreements with nations in this province. What the governance framework for a nation that will be formally recognized by the government of British Columbia should look like. These are the kinds of discussions that I expect that we will be having at the committee stage on this bill. And when we look at the bill itself, when we talk about the immunity from legal proceedings, that there would be no legal proceedings for damages commence or maintain against a public official of the Haida Nation because of anything done or omitted in the exercise or omitted, intended exercise of the responsibilities of the public official. I think it demonstrates the level of governance, again, the, the reason why I took a little time just to walk through some of the important provisions in the Constitution. Because I would expect the government would have that level of assessment when it sets out an immunity provision in this act. Now, Madam Speaker, I did not have the opportunity because government brought closure in the fall to another related bill. That bill put in place the Judicial Review Procedure Act amendments, which related to how decisions of an indigenous governing body could be subject to judicial review under that act. As members of the opposition, we had no opportunity to ask any questions on that bill because of the closure. I hope that we have the opportunity to understand the nature of the governance thresholds that the government expects for a nation of our province in order to have this formal recognition. Because not only is there immunity under this act, but they're also subject to Judicial Procedure Review, Review Procedure Act. Now, I appreciate, Madam Speaker, that as the Minister and I will discuss, Indigenous Governing Body is, is set out in, in different contexts, in different ways, under DRIPA. But these things and these aspects are connected. They're certainly connected when we look at other Indigenous communities, like the Wet'suwet'en, who, as we know, under their MOU, with the federal and provincial governments, there is still work that's being done, important work, 
for the Wet'suwet'en peoples, both hereditary and elected, within that community to understand and appreciate what their governance is. But it's important. It's important to consider, again, what level a nation needs to present as, and I'm trying to choose my words carefully, because again, it's not for us to say, but there is in the sense that the nation and the community needs to work that out, which is clearly what's recognized in the Wet'su and in MOU. But I do think it's important for any indigenous nation and first nation in our province to have a clear understanding as to what the expectations are as to how to get there. Because that formal recognition, as this bill would be providing to the Haida Nation, is what other nations may want, may want to get to in order to progress their relationship and to address the kinds of further work that will be done with the government in this province. I know that with this recognition, we will have a greater opportunity for that nation to continue to use the settlement approach from a court decision 21 years ago. We've seen other settlement with the Blueberry River First Nation. We've seen consensus agreements with Treaty 8 nations as well. We've seen the recent treaty entitlement announcement with the federal government and the provincial government re relating to land and, and compensation for lost economic opportunity as well. These are issues for nations in our province that date back decades and decades. And I think it's very important that we take the time in this house so that we all understand the reasons for how we got here and how we're going forward, the progress that's being made. Because it's very important to keep that in context. So with this recognition agreement and legislation, we have an understanding that the Council of the Haida Nation will be on, on behalf of the Haida Nation, will be able to enter into agreements and contracts, commercial and other financial arrangements, the ability to acquire, hold, and dispose of property and assets, to bring or defend actions before courts. This is the kinds of recognition that you expect a nation to be having. And I know that as we look at the fiscal relationship with nations in our province, the important work that needs to take place. As we look at the tax authorities, as we look at other ways for which we can provide the right level of economic partnership with nations to enable them to have the resources, to have the programs to take care of their children, for example, take responsibility for their children back under Bill 38 as we debated at length last session that we all want to ensure that just like with the Haida Nation, this type of recognition legislation is extended to other nations in our province. So we can further the progress in our continued work around economic reconciliation and other forms of reconciliation with First Nations and Indigenous nations in our province. So with that, Madam Speaker, I look forward to uh, reviewing those matters with the minister at committee stage. Thank you. Recognizing the House Leader of the Third Party. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, appreciate this opportunity to speak to Bill 18, the Haida Nation uh, Recognition Act. I think I first want to uh, just acknowledge, and the minister noted uh, Guja, and, um, and I, I, 
I think also in, in recognition of the many uh, leaders uh, from the Haida Nation who have um, advanced the relationship with the provincial government to, to where it is today, and we're standing here uh, talking to the bill to Bill 18. Um, and, and certainly, I think Guja is the most well known uh, of those leaders. And uh, it has taken uh, incredible leadership in our communities, First Nations communities, Indigenous communities across the province, uh, a level of patience and, and persistence that um, is unmatched uh, in order to uh, achieve, as the, the um, official opposition critic and the minister have talked about, the uh, legal advances to get us uh, to where we're at uh, today have taken uh, no uh, end of effort on behalf of Indigenous leaders. I often say that uh, Indigenous leaders in this province, in British Columbia, and indeed across the country, uh, are some of the most powerful leaders that we see uh, in, in this place. And it's because they are often required to do so much with so little. There, uh, as the, um, the uh, official opposition critic just noted in talking about um, the, the fiscal reform that's much needed, the reality is, is that this chamber, the power that is in this place, controls almost everything about uh, Indigenous lives. The power that is within the House of Commons uh, controls the, uh, through different pieces of legislation uh, the pace and the flow at which decisions are being made. And without that fiscal reconciliation, a companion to the uh, Declaration Act, which enshrines the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, these are twin, they're, they're companion uh, initiatives that need to be taken uh, in concert with one another. And I know that we first advanced the legislation here in the province, the, the first province to do so in the country, even uh, the, the first um, uh, governing body um, in the country to advance the, the, the Declaration Act and to enshrine the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act into law happened right here in British Columbia. We did this uh, unanimously. And I think that, as I've said in, in other uh, speeches uh, with respect to First Nations rights, title, inherent rights and title, uh, that the passing of that law uh, unanimously is really important. It's critical for First Nations and it's important that um, when our mi Minister of uh, Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation and the government speak to that, that they do continue to remind all members and that when we uh, speak to this as members of the opposition continue to be reminded that we stood with government. Oftentimes the stories that are told about this place are of the division of this you know two sword length line that that runs between this side of the house and that side of the house. But I think that it's important for indigenous leaders to know that when important laws are being made, important actions are being taken within this legislature, that every uh, effort has been taken to build consensus. Because uh, as the Indigenous nations, Indigenous people have existed on the landscape and, and, and engaged in the land and the waters of this uh, beautiful place since time immemorial, uh, it matters little to them or it should matter, matter little to them who's on this side of the house and who's on that side of the house. What matters is that they know that when they're engaging this house, that they're engaging uh, a mature governing body that does its work well in here and that can deliver for them consistency so that then when we are working uh, with the leaders, leaders such as Guja and many others across the province, that whether it be this year or two years from now, that the, go the government here is 
uh, doing everything in its power to ensure that the decisions that are coming out of it are embraced by members of the House, of the whole House, as much as we possibly can. It's not to say that there's going to be differences of opinion. There absolutely will be differences of opinion. But that building of consensus is really important so that then we can continue to celebrate the acts of reconciliation, the journey of reconciliation as one is that we're taking collectively. And I think today as we hear these, uh, the comments that have been made first by the minister and then by the, the official opposition critic, that the questions that will be asked will be in an effort to advance the entire conversation. And it's with that spirit that I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, the work that this minister has done uh, to advance uh, Indigenous reconciliation and relations. Uh, as uh, I was uh, given a, the benefit of a phone call to be notified that this bill was coming, I said, the, I said the, these words to the minister privately, and I think that they need to be on the record. I, as, as much as we push and prod and test each other, uh, in debate and in discussion, which is a necessary part of building consensus and testing and making sure that we're sure about what we're doing. Uh, it's important to also balance that with the recognition that we are in a substantively different place today because this minister and the former minister continues to build on the efforts of the previous ministers to advance reconciliation. And it's a collective effort of the ministers uh, responsible for the file in here, but it's also, as I framed it early, a uh, testament to the incredible and powerful leadership of Indigenous leaders in the province. So I just raise my hands in gratitude and, and, and thank um, the minister for continuing this important work. Bill 18 is a bill that declares the inherent rights of governance and self-determination of the Haida Nation and the Council of the Haida Nation as being the government of the Haida Nation. And I think it was only a few years ago uh, that we were kind of doing battle about whether or not we were ever going to mention inherent rights, because that, those are very, very powerful words, especially when you put them together in a sentence. Because it, it, the, the, the power of those words actually in themselves start to undermine and deteriorate the power that this place feels that it has exclusively, because it's no longer exclusive if there's others that have the inherent rights to be able to generate revenue off of their lands and make decisions for their people, just as this, just as this bill is doing uh, for the Haida. And it's also important to recognize, as, the, uh, as uh, my colleague in the official opposition mentioned, that as with every one of these agreements, all of the other nations in the province are looking to the progress that's been made and saying, how can they also uh, engage in that? So this legislation uh, is going to be followed by agreements by the Council of Haida Nation to address the Haida governance and jurisdiction, starting with protected areas and Haida title lands, uh, free of uh, third party interests, as well as the negotiation of fiscal arrangements, which has been noted is a very important part uh, of this work. As has been noted, this has been a, a long journey for the Haida, starting uh, 21 years ago, and, and this, uh, the negotiation and litigation the dual process continues uh, together. And with the changing tide framework for reconciliation, uh, the Council of Haida Nations have received uh, good faith measures, funding from both the federal and the provincial governments, of which they are going to be using to do what Indigenous nations do when they get resources, and that's invest in their community and invest in their governance uh, and, and, and build their communities. It's important to note that the words from the Haida Nation that this recognition agreement, to, from their perspective, is not a treaty. And the very clear statement that I think that needs to be mentioned in the context of this, that it does not grant the Haida rights, because the rights are inherent. And I think that that's uh, something that's important to acknowledge here. It simply recognizes that the Haida's nation, the Haida nation's inherent rights to governance and self-determination exist, and that we will be engaging uh, with each other, this governing body and their governing body from that perspective. With that, I um, have the honor of reading some words from 
uh, a member of uh, my colleague from Couch and Valley's constituency office, uh, Ot Takin Jad, Ot Takin Jad, Rose Williams, as she's known. Rose joined us last spring in the BC Green Caucus as one of our legislative interns and uh, has been working with Sonia, or sorry, has been working with the member from um, Couch and uh, for the last number of months. And uh, I've always appreciated uh, her perspective and asked if she would be willing and prepared to, pr to have me say a few things from her perspective as someone who is Haida and how this makes uh, Rose feel about, um, about this, where we're at today. So here are those words uh, from Ot Takin Jad. The Haida phrase for reconciliation translates to people working together to make things right. And this bill, the Haida Nation Recognition Act, is a vital step towards making things right. As Haida, we understand our deep connection to the lands and waters of Haida Gwaii. The archipelago has been the homeland to my nation since time immemorial. My relatives tell me stories of the last ice age. Our ancestors gathered atop the highest mountains where the ice didn't reach to discuss governance and the upcoming plans for the year. Potlatches were held to honor significant events, redistribute wealth, and for the people to witness governance. Our ancient teachings tell us of the importance of yak u dung, respect for all living things. Despite our strong systems of governance, cultural practices, and close relationships to the land, the colonial governments of so-called Canada stood to diminish us. The potlatch ban criminalized our culture and our systems of governance for nearly seven decades. Generations of Haidas were forbidden from gathering, feasting, and practicing our culture. Generations of Haida children were taken from their homes and forced to attend residential schools across the province. And despite the best efforts to diminish us, my nation remained strong and our culture survived. When I was 12, I distinctly remember my sixth grade teacher walking into the classroom brandishing a shiny new globe. We took turns spinning the globe and placing our fingers on the tiny archipelago in the Pacific. Finally, Haida Gwaii. Our place name was finally accurately reflected on the globe. Although the name change alone didn't make up for the centuries of colonial violence, the cultural genocide experienced by my nation, it was the proof that the colonial governments of so-called Canada were willing to make things right. We are reclaiming and revitalizing what makes us Haida. Not long ago, our language, our culture, our connection to the land, and our very existence was threatened. I feel so grateful to exist in this monumental time of resurgence. The changes that have taken place in recent decades are remarkable. And although there is a long way to go, the Haida Nation Recognition Act propels us forward. I honour my ancestors and my relatives, the Council of the Haida Nation, the elected governance of Skidigit and Olmasset, and our hereditary chiefs and matriarchs. So much good work has been done to get to this point. The Council of Haida Nation is unique, was not created under the purview of a colonial authority by the way of the Indian Act, but rather through the efforts of the community. The Council of Haida Nation encapsulates the voices of elected officials, hereditary chiefs and matriarchs, and their decision-making is guided by Haida laws and values. This bill recognizes that we have always known, what we have always known to be true, the Haida Nation has inherent rights of governance and self-determination. We have an inseparable connection to the land and waters of Haida Gwaii. As Haida people, we have a responsibility to honour this connection by governing our homelands through Haida law. This bill affirms our right to do so. By recognising our inherent title and the rights as Haida people, 
provincial government is taking the steps forward to making things right. Hawa. High school CM. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further speakers, uh, does the minister wish to close debate? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to briefly comment on the very thoughtful speeches by both the member for Vancouver Langara and the member for North Saanich and the Islands. Um, I, I just want to say thank you for their consistent support for initiatives involving reconciliation. It's one of the things, Madam Speaker, that makes me so proud to be a, a part of this wonderful province of British Columbia because it's clear for all to see the level of mutual commitment that we have in this place, this legislature, where we represent the people of our province. That mutual support for the efforts that are finally being, being made. And so I find, it, <coughs> I find it very moving and I'm grateful. So the support of comments and the member for Langara's reference to the Constitution being available, transparent, and the governance system was very, very helpful. And I was very moved by the words of Rose Williams uh, speaking about Yaku Dung. And anyone who, like myself, has had the great pleasure of seeing all of Haida Gwaii from Masset to the, uh, to the southern part of, uh, of Moresby Island and to, and to experience Haida Gwaii, anyone who's been there will know how unique that part of our province is. And it's not surprising that, and the member for Saanich North and the island uh, acknowledged and, and uh, saluted the leadership of the, of the Council of the Haida Nation over the years. And I too want to reference Gujal, who now goes by the name of Gdanska. But I also want to reference Miles Richardson, who was also president of the Council of the Haida Nation for his leadership. Uh, both of those gentlemen have been friends of mine for over 40 years. And of course now, Gogwis, Jason Alsop, who continues that tradition of strong leadership as president of the Council of the Haida Nation. So I want to thank the members for their speeches, and I too look forward to our committee uh, uh, debate. And uh, with that, Madam Speaker, I move second reading. Members, the question is second reading of Bill 18. Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. The motion is carried. Minister Speaker. of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I, I move that uh, the bill be referred to the committee of the whole House to be considered at the next sitting of the House after today. Members, you've heard the question. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I believe we are uh, at the point where we're doing third reading on Bill 11, the Election Amendments Act. Attorney General. Um, I move third reading of the bill. Members, the question is third reading of Bill 11, Election Amendment Act 2023. Those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. Bill 11. No. <laughs> Bill 11, 2023 has passed third reading. Election Amendment Act 2023. And that's it. Government House Leader. Pardon me, Madam Chair. Um, so I'd like to call second reading on Bill 24, the Miscellaneous Statutes Amendment Act, number two. Attorney General. I move that the bill now be read a second time. The bill proposes to amend the listed acts as follows. Child, Family, and Community Service Act, 
Young people from government care want to thrive, not just survive. This proposed legislation will amend the Child, Family, and Community Service Act and build on our suite of supports and services for youth as they leave government care and transition to adulthood. The proposed amendments will enable the ministry to support all young people from care, sometimes it, it didn't previously have the legal authority to do, up to the age of 27. Expand eligibility for new comprehensive transition supports, making them more accessible to all young adults from care, regardless of legal care status. Support young adults from care to maintain stable housing by making emergency pandemic housing supports permanent and providing a rent supplement program. Provide an unconditional monthly income supplement up to, uh, up to 1250 until the age 20 to cover living expenses and maintain that funding until the young adult's 27th birthday if they participate in eligible programming. The next one is to the Societies Act. This change is a technical correction to the Societies Amendment Act 2021. That act added a new regulation making power to the Societies Act to create an ability for post-secondary student societies formed under the Societies Act to receive member lists from the post-secondary institution. It was recently discovered that the regulation power inadvertently omitted student societies at Royal Roads University and Thompson River University from its scope. Uh, the Human Tissue Gift Act. The Human Tissue Gift Act governs organ and tissue donation in British Columbia. Under the act, organs may be donated by a living donor for transplant into another living person or after a donor's death, which is described in the act as a post-mortem transplant. Organ donation is critically important to extend the lives of hundreds of British Columbians each year, and more than 50% of donations are post-mortem donations from registered donors. These amendments will provide, improve patient-centered health care, reduce procedural barriers, and support organ donations by allowing nurse practitioners, in addition to medical practitioners, to make a determination of a patient's death for the purpose of post-mortem organ donation. The proposed amendments would not burden or broaden the nurse practitioner's scope of practice to include um, the determination of death using neurological criteria. The authority of a nurse practitioner to make a determination of death would be limited to circumstances in which the fact of the donor's death may be determined using circulatory criteria. Expanding the healthcare professional that can declare death prior to post-mortem organ transplant will increase the chance of successful recovery of viable organs, which could have significant benefit for British Columbians awaiting transplant. The next is the Strata Property Act. Contrary to government's intent, some lawyers are advising strata corporations that the amendments to the Strata Property Act in Bill 44 um, last fall allow them to continue enforcing all previous age restriction bylaws. This amendment will clarify that not only can strata corporations not pass bylaws setting a minimum age um, that is less than 55, but they can but they also cannot have or enforce such bylaws they have already passed. The amendment would, would be made retroactive to November 24, 2022 to hold harmless anyone inappropriately facing bylaw enforcement action since Bill 44's royal assent. Employment Standards Act. Uh, early this year, government passed legislation establishing the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation as a provincial statutory holiday to be observed every September 30th, starting in 2023. This is a significant step forward in BC's reconciliation journey. Government heard from our Indigenous partners that public commemoration of that day is a vital, vital of part of furthering the reconciliation process. It is important to support as many British Columbian workers as possible in publicly as observing that day. As such, amendments to the Employment Standards Act are necessary to ensure that entitlement to the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation statutory holiday applies to eligible unionized workers regardless of the provisions in their collective agreement. This will help encourage all BC workers to participate in publicly public commemoration events on that day. Um, to the Vancouver Charter. Uh, the proposed amendments to the Vancouver Charter have two key goals, to provide the City of Vancouver um, with a modernized general fee authority and to enhance Vancouver's authority to require reimbursement from defaulters in property-related matters um, for work done by the City. 
Um, these amendments will respond to a specific request made by Vancouver to address um, some limitations of the existing fee of, of and defaulters expense uh, in the Vancouver Charter. Specifically, the amendments um, will enable Vancouver to establish or regulate fees for the use of municipal property or any service that is authorized to provide, it is authorized to provide under the Vancouver Charter through bylaw. The amendments will also provide Vancouver the broad authority to make remedial action and recover the costs at the expense of someone who defaults on a property related requirement by the Vancouver Charter. These amendments bring Vancouver in, into line with the authorities all other local governments have under the Community Charter. Um, Mr. Speaker, I think note in the hour, um, I reserve my place and move adjournment of the debate. Members have heard the question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Uh, acting Government House Leader. Oh, sorry, we have to do the reports. Thank you. Uh, committee Chair. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Committee of Supply Section A reports progress on the estimates of Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure and seeks uh, and asks leave to sit again. When shall the committee sit again? Uh, at the next sitting. So ordered. Committee Chair. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a Committee of Supply Section C reports progress on the estimates of the Ministry of Mental Health and Addiction and asks leave to sit again. When shall the committee sit again? At the next sitting. So ordered. Acting Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. I move that we now adjourn. Members have heard the question. All those in favour? Aye. Opposed? Carried. Thank you, members. We'll see you at 1 p.m.